Well, welcome again to the Reading Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. Uh, last uh, week we had somebody in from out of town, and, and this week we have someone who's very closely related to BYU, or to BYU, good grief. We were talking about colors earlier. Uh, and I think, yeah, 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 cut that, let's go. Welcome to the Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. We are thrilled to have with us today Craig Porter Rollins, who is the Chief Executive Officer of L.J. Cooper uh, Wealth Advisors. And he's also a published author with a new book having recently come out, and I think he's going to share something about that with us today. And that is available in our bookstore and on Kindle starting tomorrow. Uh, L.J. Cooper Wealth Advisors is a fee-based company registered with the SEC. Uh, it's nationally ranked uh, by Wealth Manager and Financial Advisor Magazine. He has offices in Utah, Colorado, and Florida, skiing, skiing, and beach. Uh, Mr. Rollins serves on the board of directors for the Real Estate Investment Securities Association, the advisory board of the Center for the Advancement of Leadership at Utah Valley University, our own Cal board, and the board of advisors for Thanksgiving Point Institute. Um, I hope he'll be telling us a little more about his direction, or the direction of the uh, Thanksgiving Point Half Marathon 5K and Kids Fun Run, which he started in 2009. He graduated from Provo High School. He is an alum, and this is where the earlier mistake comes in. He's an alum of Utah Valley University before it was Utah Valley University, and he actually was a student body officer here and has the ring to show it. Now, you notice that the gemstone in the ring is blue. Um, how many of you know when Utah Valley University changed its colors to green? Anybody? This will give you an idea of how long ago he was here. Anybody know that? So UVU was blue and gold up until 1988. So sometime before then. So while at UVU, Craig was a student body academic vice president, served as the student body senate president, and was also the Delta Epsilon Chi president. Um, he, Craig helped start a mutu an actual mutual fund, something very rare among people within the state of Utah, the Ladenberg Thalman Fund. Look it up to see how it's currently doing. The ticker symbol is LTAFX. Now, that's the official kind of introduction. On a little more personal note, I would just like to express my great appreciation to uh, Craig Rollins. He served on our Cal board now faithfully. He was recently instrumental in helping uh, get us a gift, a substantial gift over a period of five years that will help students uh, receive some kind of tuition reduction or a scholarship here at UVU. In addition, he's just been a good friend of the program. I've come to appreciate him personally and his contribution. And so I'd like to have you join me in welcoming Craig Porter Rollins. Okay, we got this going now. You know, it's funny because when I left uh, UVU, I actually went to the University of Utah, which is definitely red. Uh, but I uh, uh, love my time here. It was a very exciting time. And yes, it was 1986 was the, uh, my last year here. So uh, quite a while ago, quite a while ago. I've, made some, I've written down some notes, and these are basically questions that uh, I've been asked uh, over the years from students just like you. Uh, uh, I tend to get the same questions over and over and over again. So uh, real quickly, uh, before I go into a little bit about me, I, I grew up in southwestern Kentucky. I'm just a hillbilly at heart. Uh, did a lot of uh, running around, hunting, fishing, uh, swimming in the river. Uh, didn't wear shoes very often. I mean, I was pretty much, a, uh, pretty much a hillbilly. In fact, it was kind of funny. The part of the country I grew up in was one of the poorest parts of the country and one of the poorest parts of our state. We used, to we used to joke a lot that uh, broke was up here. We were so far broke that broke was above us. So uh, it's been kind of interesting to, to move away from that area and uh, found myself out in Utah eventually and, and ended up staying and, uh, for quite some time and realizing that there is so much opportunity in the world and sometimes you've got to change your location in order to experience uh, opportunity. So... Not that there is an opportunity wherever you are, there is, but uh, sometimes you got to move, change your latitude, and see what uh, see what the world has to offer you. So, uh, real quick, I'm gonna I've I've got Randy down here, or excuse me, Dr. Beckham down here. Is it Dr. Beckham right? Yeah. Anyway, he, he's down here. He's gonna keep track of time so I can give you a chance to ask answer some questions or ask some questions. First common question I get asked more than anything is, you know, what is success? Okay, anybody want to know what is success? Nobody? Good. Okay, we'll pass that one by. No kidding. Uh, success is unique to each person. It's like a fingerprint. 
It's like a fingerprint. Uh, it rarely does, uh, rarely does a person achieve success totally by themselves. If you look deep enough at someone's success, you'll find a parent, a coach, a teacher, a mentor. Uh, you may find a spouse. You may find a sibling, a business partner that has contributed to that individual's success. Success cannot be achieved without others' help. It's just not possible. Uh, you know, you talk about the self-made millionaire or the self-made billionaire, whatever you want to phrase you want to use. It, there, there's no way possible they were self-made. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't have a tremendous amount of drive and determination, but rarely have I ever seen anybody that was completely self-made success. It's not possible. You've got to have other people involved. Um, which brought me to the next question, most common question I've ever asked. Is there one attribute that is most important in, in achieving success? Anybody want to take a guess at, at the most important uh, attribute? That's a good one. Diligence, honesty, perseverance. These are all good. But is any one more important than another? Shake your heads no. No. Right. That's right. There is no one attribute more important than another. Those are all important. In fact, if there was, it's not really an attribute. It's a, a philosophy maybe. Maybe it's an emotion. But if there was something that was most important before all of these things, you got to love what you do. You know, I think Steve Jobs, they were talking uh, on the news last night about his passing, which is, you know, what a tremendous icon, uh, an individual. I mean, you could almost look at him as the Thomas Edison of our day uh, with all that he created and what he did to develop the Internet, computers, personal computing. You know, there's probably not a person in here. In fact, I'm looking out there. I see Apple, apples all over the place. You know, what a testament to him. But he, he made a comment in his 2000, 2005 address to, I think, Stanford University was, you got to love what you do. And that is so true. You've got to love what you do, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. you got to love what you do if you want to be successful. Because success is really a matter of perspective. Did you know that? Anybody want to disagree with that? Shake your head no. Good. Good audience. Drive, determination, these are very important. You've got to have drive. You've got to have determination. You've also got to have passion. You've also got to have knowledge about what it is you're trying to accomplish. You've got to be able to set goals. You've got to be able to plan, persevere. All of those are attributes of success. You've also got to be a good teammate because, like I said earlier, I've never met anyone, even those that are determined, self-made, that did not have a tremendous team of people supporting them throughout their lives. So all of those things are important. There is not one attribute that is more important than another. And I think if you were going to, um, if you were going to basically sum up success or sum up uh, attributes of success, I think it really does go back to what Steve Jobs said. You just got to love what you do. I love what I do. I, I can never imagine myself doing anything else but what I'm doing right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got a great company. I've got a great team of people around me. They make me look really smart. In fact, I've got two partners that are so good at what they do, I can literally come out here and make just wild, outlandish claims because I know that more than likely they can make it really happen. And that's important in our success. Of course, now I have to admit they do get after me from time to time and tell me that they really can't do that. And I said, well, I've already said that you could, so figure it out. And they go to work, and they're awesome, and they're great at it. One question I get asked a lot is, have I ever failed miserably? Emphasis on miserably. Anybody here think I've ever failed miserably? What, no no's? Everybody, yes? <laughs> yes, I have. I've had many failures. Many, 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 many failures. Uh, some of them were very public. Others were very private. Uh, but you can't have success. You can never experience true success until you understand failing. I had somebody ask, are you ever afraid of failing? I'm really not, and you shouldn't be either. You should never be afraid of failing. What you should be afraid of is quitting. That make sense? 
You should fear quitting. You should never fear failing. Thomas Edison failed, I guess if you want to call it that, a thousand times to create a light bulb. Are you familiar with this story? He failed a thousand times to create a light bulb. When he was asked about this tremendous failure, he basically said, no, I, I didn't fail a thousand times to create a light bulb. I just found a thousand ways that I couldn't create a light bulb. It's just a matter of perspective. You know, failing is, is important to success. Failing is important to achieving. Because if you're not failing, then you aren't trying. It's when you quit trying is when you truly fail. You know, so fear quitting. Don't ever fear failing. In fact, applaud yourself on failing. It's the only way you're going to ever be able to recognize success when you have it and appreciate it and typically hold on to it a lot longer than if it comes too easily to you. Um... Ha <laughs> ha. This is another fun, fun question. What advice would I give myself to my 20 year old version of myself? Well, first off, my 20 year old version probably wouldn't listen to any advice I would give them. So that's kind of a moot point. Uh, I've got a 20 year old son, so when I, when I get asked that question, I think of my own son. And, and basically, I think he says that uh, my advice is stupid, teachers are stupid, life is stupid, jobs are stupid, responsibility is stupid. Uh, but he is holding down a good job, good-looking kid. But I was probably very much like him when I was 20 years old. So I, I might have had a hard time taking my own advice. Uh, if I were to give myself advice when I was 20, I would probably say stay focused on your education because that's the advice I give him. Stay focused on your education. Don't walk away from your education. Uh, I, uh, I was here for a couple of years, served on student council. Uh, it was a great experience. Uh, created the student senate, wrote the constitution for the student senate uh, back in a million years ago. And, uh, and transferred to the University of Utah uh, my senior year. I was two semesters away from graduating with a bachelor's degree. Ran out of money. So scared to death of getting a student loan because I was scared that I wouldn't have the ability to repay it or it would be devastating that I refused to take a student loan and uh, went into the workforce. And guess what happened? Yeah, I'm the president of my company and I, I'm definitely not complaining financially, but I never did quite get back to finish. So I would tell my 20-year-old self, stay focused on your education. There will be plenty of financial opportunities for you. Don't get distracted by the job. Don't get distracted by the career. Get your education. Talk to anybody who's coming back to this institution that's 40 years old or 35 or 50, and they will tell you, I wish I would have stuck it out and finished my education when I was 20-something because it was a lot easier then. So that's what the advice I would give my 20-year-old 20 20 self. There will be plenty of opportunities in the future. You don't need to be in a big hurry. What books do you read? Anybody interested in what books I read? I really like Run, Spot, Run. That's a great book. I can get through that in a couple minutes. That's a great book. You guys, do you know what Run, Spot, Run is or Run, Jane, Run? You guys even know what that is? I'm really old, aren't I? <laughs> that was the first grade reader. No, I'm kidding. Um, I look at what my daughter's reading. She's 11 years old, and I look at the books she's reading in sixth grade, and I looked at the books that I was probably reading when I was in sixth grade, and I must have been remedial, I think. Uh, she's, uh, you know, she's reading like the Twilight series. That's the vampire one, right? Yeah. Um, Tipping Point is a book that I love. I've, I've really enjoyed. In fact, I've read that one a couple of times. Uh, Tipping Point is a great book. I highly recommend it because it it explains some of the of the the points that that successful or failure type things go through. Uh, Tipping Point is basically uh, a good example. Is uh, well, we'll use Apple again because we're talking a little bit. We talk a little bit about Steve Jobs. When, when he first came out with the concept of having a personal computer on your desk, uh, you have to realize that the era that I grew up in, computers were in large rooms at uh, companies and institutions like this, and you had punch cards. 
In fact, my very first computer programming class here at UVU was learning programming uh, basic language. Okay, that was a class offered at the college level, uh, basic programming. Um, it was, uh, you know, exciting stuff, but we were still, I mean, punch cards were common. And so he said, I'm going to take this $50,000 computer that's in a room, and I'm going to put it on somebody's desktop for $5,000. Now, $5,000 was still a lot of money back in the early 80s, but he said, I'm going to do this. And, and he did. You know, so tipping point came when more and more and more people started liking what he was doing, and the pieces kind of lined up, and the, the economics and the society and the idea all came together at the right time, and boom, there goes Apple, Right? That's Tipping Point talks about the, the series of events that take place to get something to uh, overwhelming success or failure. It talks about some uh, diseases in there, too, and how tipping points, uh, certain things that took place, tipped the scale into a pandemic. So it's a very interesting book. Highly recommend it. Another book that I've enjoyed reading is called Team of Rivals, which is about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and it's about what he did to bring people from diverse backgrounds and frankly, different parties back, at the, back in his day to uh, the same table and created a very powerful team. Uh, it's, it's an amazing story. It's how he actually was able to turn people that were enemies of his and totally opposed to his viewpoint into his greatest allies. In fact, many of whom wept when he died. And yet these were people that had crucified him in his election and in his early years as president. So... Great book, Team of Rivals, highly recommend that one. Now, obviously, I am a writer myself. I've written uh, two books now. The uh, first book I wrote called The Wholesaler's Companion, which is a sales relationship book, uh, is actually on sale in your bookstore for cheaper than you can buy it on Amazon right now. So I, I thought that was great. Um, um, and the second book that I just finished, uh, which is available on Kindle, I think, either today or tomorrow, called The Emperor's Dilemma, uh, the first book, A Wholesaler's Companion, is Sales Relationships and What It Takes to Be a Successful Salesperson. All the stories in that book are true. All the people are true. Uh, you can learn about Obnoxious Bob, who is a sales rep. Uh, you can learn about uh, Type A Terry. Probably you know what he's like. Uh, but they're fun stories. Uh, they're real people, and you can see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, if you're going into the sales business, I would definitely tell you, you might want to read that book before you go out and knock on somebody's door. Uh, the second book, The Emperor's Dilemma, is a fun story. I've been telling that one for 25 years. It's a story of an emperor. I'm going to give you the, the breakdown real quick. It's a story of an emperor who is uh, meditating and pondering, pondering about how he could become a better leader for the people in his empire. And he comes across, across three questions. And he can't figure out the answer to these three questions. And it's his journey of how he... He discovers the answers to these questions. I will tell you that he gets help because what did I say earlier about success? Is it a one-person operation or a team effort, right? Shake your head yes. Good, good. I don't like that. You're coachable. I like that. Uh, it's a team effort. So uh, it talks about what he goes through to become uh, or to get the answers to these questions and uh, the impact that it has on the people's lives in his empire, him, his family, and, uh, and there's a challenge at the end of the book that if you will take the answers to the three questions and put them to use in your own life and track the results, you will also experience tremendous improvement in your personal relations, in your professional relations. Uh, it's a great book. Short read. Both my books are short reads. I hate long books, except for Team of Rivals is about that thick. It took me a while to get through it. But my books are short. You know, get on an airplane, land in Denver, you've read it. So they're, they're short, they're concise, they're to the point, not a lot of fluff. Um, one of my favorite books of all time, I will, I will tell you this is completely off the topic, but there was a book uh, I read in high school. It just really impacted me. I read the series by Pearl S. Buck. Anybody know who Pearl S. Buck is? Man, I'm old. See, the old guy's down here. Oh, yeah. Pearl S. Buck, she, uh, she wrote a book called The Good Earth. Did you ever read that? Oh, Great book. It's a, about a, a man in China and his family and, and what they go through in a very difficult economic time, kind of like now. Uh, great book, uh, Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck. That's probably one of my uh, all-time favorite books, I have to admit. She wrote a series of those on that that was just excellent. Okay, well, your students getting ready to graduate sometime in the next couple of years, right? 
hopefully. Is that the game plan? One of the common questions they get asked is, is there still opportunity during the current economic crisis? What do you think? I wish I could clone myself. I really do. I'd like to have somebody come up with that because I'd like to clone myself because there is so much opportunity today. It is unbelievable to me, the opportunity out there for people. You know, my, I was raised by my grandparents. In fact, I was telling uh, Dean Wright that at the very beginning. I said, you know, I was, I was raised by my, my grandparents who were children of the Depression. And, of course, saving and, and uh, you know, being self-sufficient was a big, big issue to them. And I remember, uh, you know, my grandmother telling me one day, she says, you know, I've, I've never worried about money because I figured, I just figured out a way that we'd make it work. You know, they grew up with the, uh, the attitude of, not, I can't afford that, but how can I afford that? And that's kind of how I was taught. I mean, I just, I thought that was just the way everybody looked at it. You know, I never had anybody tell me, we can't afford that. It was, okay, well, how can you afford that? If you want a new car, if you want a, a better education, you want another career, you want nicer clothes, it's how can I afford whatever it is that you're going after? And so that's how I was raised. And it was an interesting philosophy because it was the same for a job. You know, she said, well, you can try to go work for someone else, and that's fine, but if jobs are tough, like it was in the Depression, like it was in the mid-'70s, and it was for the early '80s, uh, when I was coming out of high school and, and going into college, jobs were kind of scarce. She said, well, just create a job. If you can't find something you want to do or if nobody's willing to hire you, well, create a job. I said, oh, you can do that? Yeah, create a job. And so that's what I do. I mean, if I can't, you know, any time I've been, uh, had a difficult time and things weren't working, I just created a job. I've worked for free for people. Hey, let me come in and learn this job. I'll work for free. Usually within a couple of weeks, they're paying me. You know? Are you willing to do what it takes and what is necessary to move yourself forward? How much drive and determination do you have? Do you love what you do? If you want to be successful, sometimes you got to be willing to think from a different perspective. It's not tough. It's pretty easy. You just got to be willing to go out and do it. Okay? I'm a product of the Woodbury School of Business. I would say that I'm reasonably successful. There are people that think I'm very successful. There are others that don't think I'm successful enough. You know what? I don't care what they think. I only care what I think. I'm pretty happy. I love what I do. There's not a monetary value placed on that. I love what I do. Can't picture myself doing anything else. To me, that's successful. You can determine what success is to you. But I wish I could. I wish I could clone myself. There is a, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity out there. And I think if you were to you know, roll up your sleeves and go to work and start thinking about things from a different perspective, uh, you would be successful. In fact, the, the company that I started... Um, outside of L.J. Cooper, I started a little side company, a little publishing company for my books and speaking and all that kind of stuff. It's called A Good I Do. That's the name of the company, A Good I Do. Uh, and my, I'll tell you the story about that here in a minute, but before I get to that, the whole point was is I was thinking of ideas, and ideas are great, but I do's are better. Uh, Edison made a comment once about, about opportunity. He said, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and it looks like work. You like that? And that is so true. There are not easy opportunities. If something is too easy, it's likely not going to pay a whole lot. You know, true opportunity requires you to roll up your sleeves and go to work. And if you're willing to do that, whether that's here at school or whether that's at your place of employment, it's all the same. Whether you're studying for your degree or you're, you're working for someone else or you're working for yourself, opportunity is there if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and go to work. Uh, Warren Buffett was speaking to the Harvard Business Review, a group of students very similar to this, like this today. And, uh, and someone asked him about what it takes to be successful. And he says, well, you know, it's fun about being the boss is that you really get to work half days. And you get to choose which half of the day you work, the first 12 hours or the second 12 hours. <laughs> and that's a true statement. I'll, I'm telling you right here from where I stand, I can work the first 12 or the second 12, but I'm betting you I'm putting 12 hours in almost every day. 
Is it worth it? Well, if I hated what I did, no. But remember, do I hate what I do or do I love what I do? I love what I do. Okay. How are we doing on time? Good? Am I going too quick? Do I need to start slowing down, speeding up? Okay. All right. I'm supposed to give you time for questions. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about a good I do. A good I do is, uh, that came about because my, uh, my family would get together and we'd sit and think about ideas of things to do together as a family or something fun to do that weekend. And we'd say, well, I have an idea. Let's try this. Or I have an idea. Let's try that. Well, my daughter was two years old at the time. And you know how toddlers are. They're just learning to speak. And so they, they, they repeat what they think they're hearing. They're, they're not able to quite put the words together correctly like vegetable is vengeable. You know, that kind of a thing. Well, she was talking to us, and she I watched her eyes, kind of under these big blue eyes. She popped wide open. And she goes, I have a good I do. Let's, and she would proceeded to tell us what she or her good I do or her good idea was. The interesting thing was is that when she got done with her good I do, she launched immediately into activity that we needed to go do that right that very second. And that stuck with me. I thought, well, that's so cute. Well, honey, we're not going to do that now. No, no, this is a good I do, Dad. We've got to go do this. And so it stuck with me. And so now anytime I think of, you know, I've got a good idea, if it's really a good idea, I say, you know what? I've got a good I do. Is that true, Danny? i got a good I do. And I launch into activity. That's how Thanksgiving Point Half Marathon started. They came to us wanting to raise money. And I said, well, that's fine. But if you're asking me for a check, I don't do that. I want to create income. I want to create sustainable long-term income. I'm not interested in cutting a check. Uh, I've got a whole other presentation for that. But I said, I'm happy to help you create something that's going to be profitable long-term. So I've got a great I do for you. We're going to start a run. And we did. That run uh, last year raised about 80000 net. Next year we think we'll raise about 100000 and it should raise 100000 every single year going forward. And that's net. That goes to their children's museum out there the new one that they're building. So, you know, it's a, it's a good I do. The difference between an idea and an I do, anybody want to take a guess? Work? Yeah? Action. The difference between an idea and an I do is action. Are you prepared to take action? In fact, I got a little quote here that I wrote down to help me remember this. An idea, ideas are wonderful things, but I do's are action oriented and lead to profitability and success. I have an idea. That's nice. Lots of people, everybody in here has probably had great ideas. Any of you had such a great idea that a few years later you're walking by the store and saw your great idea in the store window? I have. Oh, man, I thought of that. Remember when I thought of that? Remember me telling you about this great idea? See, I told you this was a great idea. Yeah, but you ain't making any money from the idea. That's somebody else's idea. Or I do. So I'm going to challenge you here today that when you're thinking about great ideas or good ideas, you want to launch yourself into activity, say, I've got a good I do. And start writing down your action plan. This is a good I do. You with me on that? Who, who's going to do that with me? I want to see it. Now, you have to put your hand up. Everybody has to put their hand up. No, you can't. You know, put your hand up. Okay, there you go. Okay, thank you. That's a good I do. Okay? That's a story about a good I do. How are we on time? Time to ask questions. No. I got 10 more minutes to talk. I talk too fast. Okay, I want to tell you another story. This was my, you know, Winston Churchill once said that, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to give you a long speech today because I just didn't take time to prepare for a short one. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, there was a... Uh, there was a time in my life, it's kind of interesting, when I was uh, between, between careers, so to speak. And uh, I remember kind of sitting on the, on a, at the kitchen table, and I wasn't married at the time. I was sitting at the kitchen table, and I was kind of staring at this blank piece of paper in front of me. And I was like trying to jot down some ideas, something that I could do to kind of get things going in my mind and figure out what I needed to do next. I was really kind of stuck and um, I, in fact, it was my, was it my first year or second year? I think it was my first year here. 
And uh, I said, you know, I'm in, I'm in, anybody familiar with uh, Delta Epsilon Chi, DECA? Anybody here familiar with those programs? Okay. And I was, um, I was involved in an organization and I'd competed and had done fairly well. And it seemed to me that the testing portion of the DECA, there was com competency-based exams that you had to take for part of those, uh, for those uh, contests, for the state and national contests. And um, I was sitting there going, God, I wish there was a way that I could figure out how to make that easier for myself, maybe make that easier for some other people. And I uh, batted around a couple ideas, and I came up with a program back in the early 80s called Business Trivia. And Business Trivia was basically a board game based on kind of monopoly and trivia pursuit, trivial pursuit. And we, we, we started marketing this prior to ever making anything, going to the schools and the, the DECA distributive education programs and some of the educational uh, conferences around the country and, and actually started getting a lot of people ordering the, the game. Oh, by the way, did I tell you this is one of my phenomenal failures? Okay. Um, and so we're out at all these conferences and we're marketing this program and we're telling everybody about how great it is. We had a mock-up of the board. And, and then the reality set in when I realized that we had to actually make these things because people were starting to order them. Uh, and we got a lot of orders. And I was going, oh, what are we going to do? We, we've got to actually create this board game. So we couldn't create the four-color board mock-up that we had made because it was, we found out it was way too expensive. There again, it was a great idea, poor planning. Okay, and uh, so we finally got a board figured out. We went with a polyurethane board because it was indestructible. It would never, you know, never go away. You couldn't burn these things. It was just, you know, great. We'll never, we'll have a board forever. Uh, put the questions together for the trilogy pursuit. Put the pieces together. Now it was so bad. We found out how much it cost for plastic pieces. I ended up buying golf tees in six different colors. So every board game had six golf tees in it, six different colors, and they used golf tees to go around because hey, golf is an important part of business, right? At least that's what I thought, still do. So we had golf tees in there, found a bunch of dice, put, got a box made by a Utah box company or Salt Lake box company up in Salt Lake. They made the box for me and I went to a company here locally to make me the, the top or the, the, the uh, sticker basically that would go on the top of the box. And I realized we had, I don't know how many, we had hundreds and hundreds of orders that were waiting to be filled. And we were like going, we got, we got to get this out, we got to get this out now. This is, this is really important. So. Business trivia, uh, competency-based game for, uh, for uh, uh, I can't remember, marketing, education, da -da -da type exams. Okay. Fun game. It was a fun game. We played it here at uh, Utah Valley uh, often. It was kind of fun. So I get the stickers for 5,000 boxes. Okay? We had to fill 5,000 orders when it all was said and done. I get the sticker for the top of the box, and they'd spelled competency wrong. Problem is, they refused to accept the responsibility that they had misspelled the word because a guy in my organization, a guy in my organization had signed off on it. I never did check the spelling, and they didn't have spell checker back then. So we sent out 5,000 games to colleges, high schools, and educational programs around the country for this competency-based exam game with the word competency spelled incorrectly. <laughs> Nobody complained. Do you believe that? That was a fun, that was a fun, learning, that was a fun learning curve. Um, I'll leave you with one last, last thing here uh, um, before I go to questions. I'm, I've burned my time correctly. See, I, I got a story for 10 minutes. Uh, I'm on Twitter, by the way. If you ever want to follow my Twitter, I'm on uh, uh, at a good I do. Spelled just like that, at a good I do, uh, a good I do. Uh, no spaces, no nothing. Uh, I live by a quote, and I've lived by this quote my whole life, and will probably die with this quote on my gravestone, more than likely. It's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, he said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. I live by that. I, I invite you to, to include that in your quotes or sayings or things that you, you talk to yourself about, but nothing great is ever achieved without enthusiasm. Thank you, and I'll open it up to questions now. We have a microphone for them? No? Okay, you're going to have to yeah, yell at there, me. There is a microphone sitting on the stand. Oh, right here. Oh. And I have a microphone here I can pass on to. There you go. 
Dean Wright has a microphone in his hand, if you have a question. Does that mean I get the first question? Yeah. Well, tough luck. We want questions from you guys. If there's no questions, I can just tell you another story. I was just uh, curious to know, right over here. <laughs> I'm right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just curious to know, um, in the first real success that you had um, as an entrepreneur to create uh, your business, um, the way that you went about it financially, you said you didn't plan very well the first time. What did you do the next time after that? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it was, yeah. I learned that planning was important. I learned that it's good to have these things kind of outlined a little bit better than what I had the first time. Um, Probably the first, my first successful business, um, I uh, kind of started falling back on, on what you're taught in, in you know, basic business classes, marketing classes, uh, business plan. Uh, the business trivia game <laughs> uh, was basically uh, an idea in my head and we kind of launched into activity before we ever wrote anything down. I wasn't even sure how we were going to finance it. In fact, I didn't realize financing was important until people started saying, well, I can do that for you, but it's going to cost you. Um, but what we did is we put together a business plan. I think the, the very next company that uh, I got involved with was a uh, mortgage company called National Note. I was a minor partner, a minority partner in that firm. And uh, we did seller carryback refinancing. Or, well, actually what we did is we actually bought seller carry back finance notes from individuals at a discount, packaged them together and sold them to Fannie Mae, you know, those types of organizations. Uh, and the funny thing about when you're buying a loan, they want money. And so we, uh, we had to arrange financing. So we had to go through, present a business plan. We had to set up a line of credit at a bank. Uh, we had to have business cards and uh, you know some marketing material. Uh, we had to be able to do the calculations and spreadsheets, so we had to make sure that we had software. Software was around by then. It was kind of cool. Software is kind of a cool program. It was kind of neat. Uh, we could actually generate those reports uh, for the individuals we were buying from. So we found out there were like this whole cavalcade of steps that had to take place before we could ever buy one single mortgage. And, and there was some expense involved in that. And I don't remember the dollar amount today, but uh, that business was significantly more successful than the business trivia was. And yes, we made sure all the words were spelled correctly on that one. So, but yeah, uh, business plan is important. Uh, what's it going to cost for you to be, stay in business? That's, business sustainability, I think, is the number one overlooked criteria for people who start a new business, is business sustainability. Business sustainability is... How much financing or how, is your, how are you able to stay in business long enough to see profits? Most people will go into a storefront, and it's amazing to me how they how you're able to get money. I've seen people open up a storefront business, a retail business, and only have operating capital for 90 days. That's not enough. You know, if you're going to open up a restaurant, you better have two to three years worth of money saved up so that you can pay your employees, pay for your, your materials, pay for the food, pay for the you know, staff, the building, the insurances, long enough for you to start recouping and making a profit. Too many people go into business and do not have a business sustainability plan. That's probably more important than getting your initial financing. Okay? Any other questions? Good question. I can do a song and dance. Oh, I've got a book to give away too. You know, before we before we get everybody out of here, so I gotta, I'll do I'll do that real quick. I actually picked a seat before. This is my first book, uh, the Wholesaler's Companion, and I've I've signed it. I just got to put whoever's name in it, and uh, I was gonna give this to row eleven, seat. Seven. Who's in row 11, seat seven? Nobody is sitting in row 11, seat seven. Closest to it. Who's closest to row 11, seat seven? Right over here? There we go. Come on down. Row 11, seat seven. 
It was on this side. <laughs> Sorry. I knew where they were supposed to be. I just didn't know who it was. Come on down. Come up afterwards and see me, and I'll put your name in this. What's your name? Eric. Eric. Yeah. Okay, you take that. I already Thank notated you. in there, but you come see me afterwards. I'll write your name in there, Eric. All right. I have a Give me a round of applause for sitting in the right seat. <laughs> question? Yeah. Um, just curiosity. I, I spent a couple of years in Kentucky and really, really enjoyed my time. Uh, what part of Kentucky did you live in, and what made you move down here in Utah? The really poor part. <laughs> uh, actually, um, um, everybody knows where Nashville, Tennessee is, right? Okay, and Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, well, there's a there's a fairly reasonably sized city called Bowling Green between the two. Okay, outside of Bowling Green to the north, there's a county called Butler County. Morgantown, Kentucky is where I grew up. Very poor, very small. And what we, made you move down here? Um, that's a more that's a more complicated answer. Uh, basically, uh, my mother decided to move out here when I was uh, in uh, uh, going from grade school to junior high. And uh, as I said, my grandparents have been raising me and she decided it was time to move us to the west. And so uh, she moved us out here and I went to junior high and high school here. In fact, I went to Provo High and Timview High School. So basically, I hated myself for four years. Um, but uh, graduated from Provo High. And then uh, there just wasn't a lot of opportunities in Butler County, even though that's where the majority of my family, my mother actually lives back there now, irony. And uh, there just wasn't a lot of opportunity there. It's uh, the average median income in Butler County last year was 19,000. Uh, it's considered one of the poverty counties of Kentucky. So it's eligible for all kinds of grants and free money, uh, but still nobody does anything there. So uh, opportunity was better out here. Plus. University of Kentucky didn't give me a scholarship, and uh, I was able to get my school paid for here at UVU. So that was another big reason. So. I have a quick question. Yeah. Where are you? Right here. Okay, okay, yeah. Right yeah I was, you mentioned the 5K. I was wondering what role humanitarianism and philanthropy plays in your business activities. Huge. Um, I don't know how someone can get to a point in their life where they consider themselves successfully financial or economically, whatever you want to call it, and not want to give back. Um, I, for me, it was just an obvious evolution. Um, I felt so grateful for the uh, opportunities I'd had and the successes I'd had. I felt like it was necessary for me to give back. I would have felt terrible if I had not given back. So. Any company that's worth their salt, that's making money, that's profitable, should be giving back. In fact, studies have shown that 85% of individuals, given the choice of working with a company that gives back to the community and one that doesn't, will choose the one that gives back to the community. So I, I think it just has to be a part of your business plan. I think that would be smart. We've got to improve our corner of the world, right? Yeah. I think that's about what we have time for today. I know Thank some you. people are sneaking out to their next classes, but... Uh, uh, on behalf of UVU and, well, quite frankly, BYU too, why not? Uh, you know, a big uh, round of applause and, and thanks to Craig Rollins. <laughs>